Ghostwood, the Twin Peaks podcast, and uh, occasionally something else. I'm one of your co-hosts, Charles Skaggs, back in Ghostwood Forest, hiding out from everyone, unfortunately, or at least most everyone, because thankfully, I'm here once again with my wonderful co-host, fellow expophile, and uh, all around just lovely person to talk to, Zan Sprouse. How you doing, Zan? I'm good, Charles. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Yes, we are hiding out from everyone, uh, especially uh, Georgia and yeah. their idiot governor and <laughs> their their overcrowded schools. I feel so bad for those kids and those teachers. It you almost know, fe- te- almost feels like a uh, that you're kind of like watching people be put to death, doesn't it? It sort of does, yes. And if you are a teacher and you are listening to this podcast, you have my undying respect right and i think you should if you are in georgia i think you should all be able to just punch the governor in the stomach just once you should all be able to line up just punch him in the gut allegedly you know for for legal reasons allegedly well yeah i think you should i don't or hypothetically hypothetically yes you are currently unable to do that but i feel that that should be a law (laughs) (laughs) if if you wanted to do it on your own we would not object Right. We don't we don't condone breaking the law, but we 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 understand. Yes. Yes. We don't. Yeah, we don't encourage, but we understand. Exactly. We understand. Exactly. All right. But that aside, uh, we're going to talk about something a little bit more upbeat because, hey, uh, we're changing up the format a little bit today. We're going to talk about a bunch of teenagers dying in the woods. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Hmm. (laughs) School kids dying. Yeah. Of mysterious causes. This is oddly topical, isn't with, it, Charles? With, with the government involved. The government and involved. Like a, and, and there being a conspiracy. What does that and remind there, me of? And there are some people who are trying to pretend like it's not real. Yeah. Huh. Hmm. And, 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 and this was 1993, you say? 1993, believe not, it or not. Not 2020? Because it sounds a lot like 2020, doesn't it? It sounds a lot like 2020. Un- uncomfortably yeah. like 2020. Uncomfortably. So, uh, yes, so. Oddly topical. I didn't think about that until this minute. <laughs> yeah, just, um, it's, it's a little unsettling. But, um, so here at episode 81, we are talking the X Files pilot, you guys. Yeah, the, obviously, you know, we talked about this a little bit last week um, when we finished up our Mulholland Drive Criterion review. And uh, what we're doing is that we're going to do this and, and then five more episodes of um, Twin Peaks related actors that appeared on the X Files. Mm-hmm. And some of the some of the more prominent Twin Peaks characters. Yeah, the actors were also in the X Files, and yeah, so we so- figured. Let's broaden the discussion, not just about Twin Peaks, not just about David Lynch, but the performers of Twin Peaks. Let's give them a shout out. Exactly. A shout out to them about how awesome they are in everything, not just right. Twin Peaks. Right. And especially with with the X-Files, you know, we've had several, so it kind of made sense. Well, hey, let's just kind of do this for a little bit. Um, so and we've also said, Charles, that there would not have been an X-Files if there had not been a Twin Peaks. Yes. Especially considering um, when X-Files started, it was 1993. So essentially we had been without Twin Peaks because uh, Firewalk with me was 91, right? 91 or 92. So yeah, we've yeah. been without Twin we've For been at least a year. Peaks, about, at least a year. About two years. Yeah. yeah. The year, year and a half, somewhere in there. Um, so obviously a lot of us were kind of like, you know, still wandering in the woods going like, well, show's over 
as far as we know, it's not coming back. We were just blindly watching Northern Exposure and waiting for American Gothic to premiere. Right, exactly. We're just looking for that next Twin Peaks. Yeah. And um, it eventually kind of came around. I mean, we did, you know, like I'm a big Northern Exposure fan, so I was all over that. But it was, you know, it was more quirky and, and more of a, a humorous um it was a quirky town that was funny rather than a quirky town that was filled with secrets. It wasn't creepy. And and when the X-Files came along, damn, it was creepy. We X-Files did fill quite – it the filled void. the Twin Peaks void for us, I think. Yeah, I think so because, um, you know, it, it was a show that, like Twin Peaks, um, my wife Lori and I, we loved watching in the dark. Uh, just kinda, okay. Kind of, you know, curled up on the couch together, watching it. The, watching X Files with watching, no lights on, watching, the maze on. Yeah, watching X Files with no lights on, the darkened living room, mm-hmm. and um, just kind of like we did with Twin Peaks a little bit. And um, so it was, you know, it it fit that that void perfectly, like you were talking about. So, uh, so here uh, we're going to talk first. We're talking the pilot because, hey, David Duchovny, right? David Duchovny, a.k.a. you know Special Agent Denise Bryson, only now she is now Special Agent Fox Mulder. There's m- room for more than one show starring a hot actor about the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Exactly, exactly. There's plenty of, plenty of hot Federal Bureau of Investigation agents to go around. And David Duchovny is hot whether or not he's wearing a dress or yeah. wearing a tie. doesn't matter. Yeah. Well, you know, you've got David Duchovny, I've got Jillian Anderson, so we're both happy people. A little something, a little something for everybody. Exactly, because uh, yep. if nothing else, Jillian Anderson cementing my love of redheads for oh, for yes. years to come. For years to come. So um, this episode, this pilot, uh, first debuted in September tenth, nineteen ninety three. It's gone back away. It's going like almost twenty seven years, if you can believe it. That was the beginning of my senior year of high school. Yeah, yeah. This was. Um, I was out of college by then a couple years and had mm-hmm. recently entered the workforce full time. So, gotcha. In a really crappy job. So, um, but, uh, but it gave me a little extra well, you cash, know. you know, to buy X Files. That's, that's what we all do right out of college. Pretty much, pretty much. It wasn't, yeah, that first job right out of college wasn't ideal. But, you know, like I said, it gave, I me, had somebody it, refer, it gave me some money. Okay. So, yeah. I had somebody refer to that as their pre real job job. Yeah. <laughs> it's my pre job. My pre real job job. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But uh, written by Chris Carter, uh, creator and showrunner, directed by Robert Mandel, and uh, guest cast. So we had, um, most notably, we get the introduction of William B. Davis as the cigarette smoking man. A.K.A. DJ Nick's idol, yeah. <laughs> apparently. <laughs> yeah, and I did not remember that about this episode. I was watching it, and I just looked, and I'm like, oh, my goodness. Yeah. Because DJ Nick's you brother in lung cancer. <laughs> cigarette smoking man. You don't have a lot. You, you don't see too many pilots that do that subtle of a job of setting up such a recurring character. So to go back and watch it and see that he's there from the beginning was quite, quite a nice yeah. reminder. I'd, I'd completely forgotten about that. Now, I don't know what the, you know, what the intention was to make him a major player right off the bat, but maybe they thought that he looked great on screen being all enigmatic guy. And they thought, and thought we need to do more with this guy. I'm sure they had something planned for him because he's there the beginning, middle, and end. You know, yeah. he's there when they meet with Scully to say, hey, we're going to assign you to Fox Mulder and the X-Files. And then he's there at the end when she leaves the office after she pre- after she presents her report. And the as implant, she's go- yeah. As she- and the implant, yeah. As she's going out, he's going in, and he does his little... Uh, whisper, whisper. Uh, yeah. Uh-huh. And his, and, is it and, his, this? and his Raiders of the Lost Ark. I was moment. gonna say his Raiders of the Lost Ark moment. Yeah. Yeah. When he when he you know he takes the Lost Ark of the Covenant. Oh wait, no, the implant, and yeah. uh, tucks it away because hey, he's he's top men, top, top. men, 
men. Yeah. Yes. And uh, takes that to the, the uh, Pentagon in the, in the basement of the Pentagon. Right. In a huge warehouse full of God only knows what. Yeah. And John Williams music plays. Oh, wait, that's something else. Like, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. That was, that was about, that was about 11 years prior. You could use that theme for that and that would be perfect, right? That would have been great, but it, you don't even need to, you know, you show somebody, you show a long shot of somebody putting something in a gigantic warehouse full of unmarked boxes. We all know what you're referencing. Exactly. Exactly. Um, William B. Davis, notable character actor. He was in uh, movies like The Dead Zone, Head Office, Look Who's Talking, believe it or not. He was also on the TV series Continuum. That's He had a pretty good role in that one. Uh, he was also in episodes of the 2010 Human Target, Caprica, Smallville. So he, You know who else is in Look Who's Talking? Who? Don Davis. Really? Yeah, yeah. Uh-oh, he, I, I'm sensing a potential future <laughs> ghost with episode. <laughs> he is her regular doctor, and William B. Davis is the doctor that gives her the epidural in the hospital when she's going into labor. Okay, it's been a long time since I've seen that movie. Yeah. Probably, probably, I think I saw it in the theater when we came out. It's an Amy Heckerling movie, so I freaking love it. I love Amy Heckerling. Yeah, I mean, I enjoyed it. It was a good movie. Um, uh we had Charles Siafi, or Chiafi, no relation. As He's been all over. Yeah, as Division Chief Scott Blevins, and uh, he's been he shows up again in a future a few more episodes later on. He shows up mm-hmm. in the episodes Conduit, Fallen Angel, and Gethsemane, and uh, Zachary Ainsley as uh, he's the um, uh, Billy. Um, Billy Myers, he turns up in, late, He turns up later in Requiem, Dead Alive. He was also in The Journey of Natty Gann. That's what I was going to bring up. He was in The Journey of Natty Gann with the ever-wonderful Ray Wise. That's right. That's right. You've, so, talked about, you've talked about Ray Wise in that before, but now you have an X-Files connection to Journey of Mad- Natty Gann. There's, yeah, it's just, there. you know, all roads lead to Twin Peaks, y'all. Now, did you know that going in, or did you, like, uh, look that up and go like, oh yeah, he was in that. He he looked familiar, and I was like, who is that guy? And and you I looked him, him up on like, IMDb. Or something? That's right. Yeah. yeah, I looked him up on IMDb. I was like, that's that's why I know him. He's in he's in that again. Which I don't have on DVD yet, and I don't know why. I was gonna say it's like one of your favorite movies. I don't know why you I wouldn't know. have that one. I know I need to have that. You talk about it all the time. I don't uh, have a wolf either, so I'm behind. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. Too busy uh, following Vanilla Ice, apparently. Why did you tell everybody? Because I didn't get that blackmail payment. I guess not. Jeez. I'm behind on my Venmos, apparently. Good Lord. All right. But uh, he was also in um, episodes of the 2002 Twilight Zone and the 1997 Outer Limits. So just thought that would bring that up. Interesting. Yep. So you got a Twilight Zone connection there as well. Um, cause I know what a big Twilight Zone fan you are. Uh, Leon Russum. I am a big Twilight Zone fan. And just to set the record straight, Charles yes. is making fun of me because I am a big fan of the Vanilla Ice Project where Vanilla Ice rehabs houses in Miami. I was moving right along. I wasn't going to address that further. I was just going to, I am gonna do, I was just I gonna... defend myself. I don't want people out there thinking that I like Vanilla Ice legitimately as a musician. Okay. I, I don't need that in my life. Right. I've got enough problems. <laughs> <laughs> See, I was I was just gonna leave that little time bomb ticking, and then I was gonna walk off. But no. And I and I love the riff tracks version of Cool as Ice. Okay. But yeah, the Vanilla Ice Project. If you haven't seen it, Vanilla Ice and all of his dumbass friends rehab million dollar houses in Miami. It's freaking hilarious. I highly recommend it. Okay. Preferably with alcohol, I'm guessing. It doesn't even matter, just because it's so funny. Because he refers to everybody as a ninja. Yeah. You know. Like, he'll be like, okay, so Billy's coming over today. He's my roofing ninja. You're like, anything that anyone yeah. does. Like, instead of the word expert, he says he calls them somebody a ninja. It's really funny. Which is a totally an 80s reference. Because it's just the, the ninjas were popular in the 80s. So, and, yeah. you know, the, the Ninja Turtles. Ninja and Turtles, whole, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. We yeah, have the Vanilla Ice Project. If you like home rehab and you like watching weird white trash, guys, it's perfect. This is for you. I just, yeah, I just don't want people thinking that I'm walking around like, 
you know, with to the extreme on my iPod because I don't do that. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, I didn't mean to make you defensive about that. I'm well, sorry. You know, you can't, you I, can't apo- I, I apologize. And not explain my secrets, Charles. Okay. Well, I apologize. Whatever. All right. <laughs> You see, you see how we are? All right. Uh, Leon Rossum played Detective Miles, Billy's father. He was in the 2010 True, True Grit remake, which I love. Which was excellent. I, I adore that film. Why well, uh, Josh Brolin did not get the Oscar for that. I have no idea. He was so freaking good in that movie. And he was in another Coen Brothers film, The Big Lebowski. Who was in The Big Lebowski? I don't know. I can't remember. I didn't write that down. I just put down he was in The Big Lebowski. But he was also in Star Trek VI and Star Trek Deep Space Nine and The Phantom. Oh, like The Phantom? With, like, with, with Billy Zane. With Billy Zane, which is a guilty pleasure I will not apologize for. Thank no, you. you don't know because that's a pretty cool movie. It's an underrated movie. Oh, yeah. I love that movie. It's a fun movie. And it's got Patrick McGowan in it, okay? The Prisoner. Yeah. Number six. Uh-huh. So, yeah. uh, so enough said there, right? Seriously. All right, who am I looking for again, Charles? Because uh, I need to know. You're who looking you... for Leon Russom, R U S S O M. Oh yes, that's right. And while you're looking that up, Sarah Koscuff played Teresa Newman in this, and she turns up later again, also in Requiem and the episode "This Is Not Happening." Ah, I thought this is who this was, and he is the chief. He is the chief of police of Malibu. Stay out of our beach community. That's Leon Russom. Okay. That so, guy. Yeah, I thought that's who that was, but I wasn't sure. And I was like, am I getting that line confused? And I, I'm like, is that – I'm like, no, that's Ben Gassara. Oh, so I was just – I was confusing it. So, yeah, he's, you know, stay out of our beach community. Well, glad we got that worked out. All I right. need to know. Okay. And knowing is half the battle. G.I. Joe. Oh, Joe. Yeah, exactly. So um, trivia. I did have some, a couple of trivia bits that I wanted to run past you. So, of course, The X-Files is inspired by Kolchak the Night Stalker, Mm -hmm. the Darren McGavin series from back in the day. Ask Emily. Exactly. Um, Chris Carter created the series in an attempt to scare people's pants off, unquote. And uh, when creating the characters of Fox Mulder and Dana Scully, Carter decided to play against established stereotypes. Mm -hmm. So he decided to make the male character the believer and... Scully, the skeptic, and because um, traditionally it was the other way around. Right. Usually, right. The, usually... usually the guy was the skeptic. Well, and it's, it's, also, an, it's also a role reversal that traditionally characters yeah. who are scientific-minded doctors are males. And the more – and the psychology – the psychologists are the females. And yes. that's completely switched with this, which I think is super cool. Exactly, because, you know, you've got Scully being a medical doctor, a scientist, and um, Mulder being this, right? you know, the guy who's, who's like... Mulder's into... a psychologist. Exactly. That's right, he does, because he he's got a criminal behavior background. Right, his background is in criminal behavior and in, like, profiling type yeah, stuff. exactly. So... You're absolutely right. And um, so there's an unfilmed deleted scene in this. Where uh, the original script gave more insight into Scully's visit to Scott Blevins' office. Mm, Okay. Apparently, the scene is set just before her visit and takes place at the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia. Mm -hmm. Where she teaches a small group of trainees about the physiology of homicide. Specifically, electrocution and death by cattle prod. And her, (laughs) her attention in this scene would have been... She uh, would have been distracted by an agent who enters the room and then hands her a note that reads, your attendance is required at Washington at 1,600 hours sharp. Uh, so <laughs> I'm pretty sure we could have lived without that. Homicide by cattle prod. Why are you telling me this? No reason. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why it made me think of that. That's funny. My all-time favorite X-Files moment is, is, is from that episode. You know, I can't think of a more undignified death than Otto Erotica asphyxiation. Yes. Why are you telling me this? No reason. Kyle Bruckman's final repose. Final repose. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Classic episode. The second best thing Peter Boyle has ever done. <laughs> after Young Frankenstein, yes. Heck yes, after Young Frankenstein. What am I? What am I crazy? No, I'm just saying. I might like to watch Vanilla Ice Rehab Houses, but I'm not stupid, Charles. I didn't say you were. I was confirming <laughs> what you know. I was just 
Okay, you're you're just trying to throw me under the bus. You're just trying to get me in trouble here. I see how it is. Hey, you threw me under the bus already, telling my secrets. You always tell the secrets. Uh, well, you know, I'm a blabbermouth, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> All right. So uh, there were two film, film scenes that were cut. Um, both featured Tim Ransom as Scully's boyfriend, Ethan Minette. I'm so glad they got rid of these because it just – I so – I don't know. Charles. Have you watched? Have you watched them? I have. I I I've heard tell of them. Okay. I have not watched them. And I don't know if I've told you this before, but when it comes to detective type stuff or mysteries or anything like that, mm-hmm. I couldn't give a rat's ass about the romantic lives of our detectives, unless it's with each other. Unless it's like, unless it's some sort of weird alien situation where they wind up having a kid together. I mean, <laughs> mm. then it's. That sounds familiar. When did that happen? A little bit ahead in the X Files, like a lot. A little bit of a so, fast forward there. Yeah. A little bit of a fast forward. Or, you know, if it's uh, like, and it, it, or it has to be completely quirky, but also have something to do with the plot, like Cooper and Annie. Yes. You know, Cooper, Cooper and Annie. Are they are together, and that advances the plot because yeah. that's partially why Wyndham Earl wants to get at her because he wants to get back at Cooper. Yeah. So there's something there, but and Scully he is, has, and he essentially being like created to be kidnapped by Wyndham Earl at some future point. Exactly, exactly, and it tells a little bit more about Norma's family. So and it's not like a huge thing; it's a small town. Blah blah blah. But I just, you know, Scully having a boyfriend yeah. was just so unnecessary, especially because there there would have been that that dichotomy there with Scully having her boyfriend and Mulder having his addiction to pornography. Yeah. So it just would have seemed kind of dumb, I think. And there's even an episode, and I don't remember which episode it is, but it's a couple episodes in where she goes to – a child's birthday party. Yeah. I think it's, is it her sister's kids? That sounds right. Yeah. Because yeah. I mean, she doesn't have, didn't have kids of her own then. No. So, she didn't so, have kids. so I think it had to be her sister's. Yeah. I think it was her sister's and she's like, so tell me about this new guy you're working with. What's he like? It's like, don't even start with me, Missy. I don't even want to, I don't even want to go down this path right now. Right. So it's like, I mean, we had, you know, well, and it's, and Scully had a flaky, very flaky hippie sister, if I recall correctly. Uh, just a little, just a little different than, yeah, very different than Scully. Very uh, nowhere near as analytical of a mind. You know, we had we she had was more our of a free spirit of it, as I recall. We had our David and I in the eighties, and that was great, but it also got old. You know. Yeah. So I just I I'm really glad that we didn't have. Well, apparently, the, that from what I was doing my research, I'm sorry to interrupt. I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, but apparently, what um, Fox, the Fox Studio executives, were the ones that were uh-huh. um, who wanted that romantic interest in there because they didn't feel like there was enough romantic tension between Mulder and Scully. And that should be fine. Right. Exactly. But um, but thankfully, Chris Carter is like. His appearance, you know, they thought the boyfriend just slowed down the scenes in which Mulder and Scully were together. And, um, you know, and he also found that, well, hey, Mulder and Scully together are uh, much more interesting. They're much more interesting. And people like Mulder and Scully with the jobs that they have. Yeah. uh, You know, and I'm sure anybody with a job like this can understand this problem. They're not. Those jobs are not necessarily conducive to yeah. relationships because, you know, hey, you know, bright and early, 8 a.m., we're flying to Portland. Right. You know, it's that's not the kind of thing that you can do. Unless you had somebody who was doing the exact same thing with you. Right. And we've seen detective shows where you have a detective that starts out with a boyfriend, mm-hmm. then they get on this case, and then they're not spending enough time with him, and then they break up, and it's it all ca- this... It causes problems and drama. It's all this manufactured drama when the drama that I want is the mystery. Yeah. So, and you have Mulder and Scully, and of course we don't necessarily know this yet. Mulder and Scully have family lives that are just wackadoo 
already, you know, like their immediately their immediate family, their parents and their siblings. So that's almost enough for them, I think. And any sort of, you know, and there there is an episode, I think, where Scully goes on a date. Yeah. And she's just bored like this. I'm just not into this right now. Right. It's, and, too, it's too mundane, too it's, everyday. Yeah. And I don't want to hear this guy complain about his accountant job or whatever he does. Yeah. He was like a lawyer and, or a doctor or something like that. Yeah, and she's doing alien autopsy. She's like, you know what? I am so not interested in your crap. <laughs> Look, unless there's a nasal implant involved, I don't care. Yeah, I don't want to hear it, okay? Yeah. yeah. Did you lose nine minutes of your life today? <laughs> I don't want to hear it, okay? Yeah. So I, I really like that they didn't do that. And even the Mulder-Scully tension was bad innuendo a lot of the time. Yeah. And so it wasn't overly done. I think they – I think they – kept a tight rein on it which was good mm -hmm. but I, I i feel like there are some shows that are conducive to relationship side stories and some that are not and i felt the x-files definitely was not yeah yeah but um well i mean it was i think it was interesting because you had there wasn't it, it, it wasn't going like you said with the intention of getting these two characters hooked up no they just, they just happened to be working together and it was very platonic at first, well, it was very right, and it was very an intimate situation where they were saving each other's lives. All you know, it wasn't just you know, it started out with the typical trope of yeah, of um. I mean, this is probably like the very one of the very first instances of shipping, because I'm sure a lot of fans, at least early on, were like going, you know, these characters need to hook up romantically, and they right. probably wrote a ton of fan fiction about it. Oh dear God, yes! So um, much fan fiction. So so much fan fiction. But even in you know even early on, I mean, early on you had I think it was probably a seventy thirty mm -hmm. until and it got to maybe more of a sixty forty where he's saving her more than she's saving him, but she's saving him sometimes too. Yeah, and right. we hadn't really seen that. We had not seen the female character save the male character before. No. No, and I was very appreciative of that. I would have liked to have seen more of it, but hey, a start is a start. Well, I mean, Dana Scully was definitely one of the breakthrough characters um, for women on television because – Very much so. You know, she was – like I said, like we were talking about, you know, she was a scientist. Uh, she was intelligent, you know, mm -hmm. not depicted as like some ditzy blonde or, or what have you, not just a secretary, far – like an actual right. e equal partner to Mulder, sometimes maybe superior to Mulder in a lot of ways. Def I and I feel like she was definitely superior to Mulder because of her being a medical doctor. Mm -hmm. She had access to things. She was able to do yeah. autopsies and review uh, coroner's reports because of that. So right. I don't particularly like the fact that, you know, I do know this was Fox in the 90s. And I don't like the fact that, you know, we can't even get through the first episode without getting Scully in her underwear. But she had a good reason for it. Yeah. So, I, mean, I mean, they did kind of at least justify it a little bit. They justified it a little bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, so there was a little skin, yes. But if you get to see Jillian Anderson in her underwear, I should be able to get to see <laughs> David Duchovny in his underwear. Thank you very much. Well, with with you know with Fox Mulder, you know, chances are he's probably going to be hanging himself at the same time in autoerotic asphy asphyxiation. I already know he's got great legs. I've seen those. So that's true. You know, he definitely uh, worked uh, that uh, that skirt in Twin Peaks. Worked that skirt in that garter belt where he was hiding uh, hiding his weapons. <laughs> that's true. Hiding his weaponry in, in that waitress uniform. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's he's a he's a he's, he's a, a man of he's a man of many talents. He is a good looking individual, regardless. No, yeah, that's funny. All right. Um, I can see how this – we're going to be good approaching this. Um, so let's get right diving into the episode now. Obviously, this is, you know, setting these two characters up. They have, you know, a great meeting uh, early on. He's so defensive. Who? Mulder. Oh, at, when, during their first meeting? During their first meeting. You think so? Because I, I, well, I mean, maybe a little bit because he had heard that he assumes that Scully was sent to spy on him, which she was. She was sent to spy on him, sent to debunk him. And just when she knocks on the door, 
His whole, nobody down here except the FBI's least most wanted. Mm -hmm. So, and he's, I think he's trying to bait her a little bit, trying to get under her skin a little bit. And I get the feeling, and, you know, of course, we never know if this is the case or not, but I get, you get the feeling that he's had partners before that don't work out. Yeah. So he's a little jaded. She's a little jaded by this point. Either they are, they can't stand working with him or... They were also sent to debunk him or – Or maybe they've been sent down to the basement as punishment for something. And that's another thing. He says, you know, what, you know, who did you piss off to get this detail? Yeah. And so y- you get the feeling that Mulder has seen this before and he's probably thinking, OK, here's another partner that's going to last a month. Yeah. And then they're going to – you know, they're going to move or they're going to – this is going to be too much for them or what, you know, what have you. So I think he's just defensive and um, belligerent at the beginning. Yeah. Just, just to sort of, I don't know, draw it out of her. Or, or you know? maybe, maybe he's just trying to get a feel for her or I don't know what, but I, I mean, I do think that there, there is some, there's definitely suspicion there and there's probably yes. a little um, concern on his part regarding her. Like what, yeah. like like what is what is what's her deal? Maybe that's probably why he's he's trying to provoke her a little bit. Right, you his know? chest is puffed out. He, yeah, he's, he's yeah, he's definitely got his chest puffed out, and he's and you it know, could he's be defensive, in, like you said. I, I agree with that. Yeah, defensive. He's a little inappropriate with her, and that could just be the fact that Mulder's kind of a weirdo. Um, it's Mulder. So, he's inappropriate with everybody. So yeah, Mulder's pretty much inappropriate with anybody. So I. Uh, I, I I like that that is how they first meet because it starts out so adversarial, but she's not having it. She's like, yeah. hey, show me what you got to show me, you know, and she even says to him, the answers are there. It's science. Yeah. You just have to know how to find them. That's what I'm here for. I'm here to find the scientific answers for everything you're seeing. I don't doubt that you're seeing what you're seeing. I just doubt it's your conclusions that we find suspect. Yeah, there's there has to be an explanation in, right. in her words. So um, one of the things I really liked about that that whole meeting uh, for the first time, Mulder talks about that you know she wrote this this um, thesis on um, I forget what it was oh something involving a, a black hole or something maybe I forget what it was but. But he, you know, he... Oh, is challenging Einstein. Einstein's, yeah. Because her undergraduate he, degree is in physics. That's right. So so she, um, he lets her know that, uh, you know, he assumes, or I guess he knows about the paper and she knows that he knows about the paper. But so she's like, you know, did you read it? And he goes, I did. Which means that he definitely researched her before she came down there to meet him. You know, like he – and he probably did his homework before she even showed up at the door. Right, and so you wonder how long did he know she was getting this gig before he knew – before she knew she was getting this gig? That's a good question. We don't find that out. Right, because you wonder was he brought into – you know, after his – Or did somebody tip him off maybe a little early about it? Something. I don't know. Did his last partner – leave in an unceremonious fashion and his superiors are saying, okay, that's it. We're giving you Dana Scully, who is the most analytical, smartest person here at the Bureau, and she's going to set you straight. Or um, if you want to challenge, here's somebody who who is not going to fall for your crap molder. I don't know what they said to him, Mm -hmm. but he obviously knew she was coming before she got there. Yeah, that's kind of of like an untold story, I think, because – yeah, uh, a little bit. I think it'd be something I'd be fascinated to know exactly, you know, how he found out about her beforehand enough to do research on her. Right. And and um, in the events leading up to that, because, you know, just before that meeting, she shows up in Blevins office uh-huh. and, and she gets the kind of sit down going like, look, we want you to pay attention to, to uh, Special Agent Mulder. He's, you know, he's um, he has some, you know. You know, he works with the X Files, these cases of paranormal and and uh, unexplained phenomena, and mm-hmm. and a cigarette smoking man is there, and being all just, enigmatic. He's just there. He's just there. He's just there. I mean, yeah. He doesn't say a damn thing, which he doesn't in a lot of early, especially early episodes. 
and mm-hmm. um, but just to give that little feeling of ominous foreboding, ominous foreboding. That this on. is bigger. That this is bigger than she realizes. Right. This is – there's something – there's more attention being – Mulder might be the weirdo who works in the basement, but there's there's more important happenings with him than meets the eye. Yeah. For sure. And this is years, years before we find out that, oh, hey, Mulder just happens to be the son of the cigarette smoking man. Still not, sh- still not sure how I feel about that, but you know, what do right. you gonna do? Yeah, it's Chris Carter. <laughs> it's his baby. He can do what he wants. But... Yeah, I didn't. I didn't write an awesome show, so <laughs> how am I gonna? I mean, it's kind of it's kind of hard to talk, right? Yeah, exactly. But um, but uh, yeah, that was that was one that kind of threw everybody for a loop on that one. However, but... I do not blame uh, Mulder's mom for having an affair because obviously they Mulder's dad was Mulder's dad was pain in the. Mulder's dad, Bill. Yeah, yeah. I Bill. don't think she picked the right guy, but you know. Yeah, yeah. Of all the guys that you're going to have an affair with, why did it have to be this guy? The guy that presumably was involved in JFK's assassination. I remember he was better looking back then, though, too. So that's true. But still, it's like she was just turned on because he chain smoked like a demon. I guess so. Like a, <laughs> like a cobra. <laughs> like a cobra. Yeah. Ducky Jones. He moved like a cobra. Like okay, a cobra. Yeah. But um so uh so here we are, they they introduce each other and then Mulder gives Scully the background on um the cases going on, the big mm-hmm. case of the episode. So they they fly out to uh Oregon, I believe. Yep. Yeah. Oregon. And, and uh Culm National Forest in Oregon. And um so you know Pacific Northwest, very Pacific, twin peaks. Exactly. So yeah, so the, there's definitely in and, and this was filmed in Vancouver. So we're obviously getting that kind of Pacific Northwest Twin Peaks vibe, yep. um, and which is you know perfect for for Twin Peaks fans looking for their next addiction. Agreed. And um, you know when they fly over the the, the, the town, uh, it gets a little turbulence. And I let you know that was a funny moment when here here's Mulder spread out over two seats, maybe three, and uh, looking all cash. And, uh, in the last time you could do that, like, you know. right, exactly. And then, and then Dana's sitting, you know, they're all you know, like with their seat buckled and everything. And, you know, then that turbulence, she's hits. reading the case file, yeah, and exactly. all the, doing, uh, yeah, doing her homework. And, and then the, there's the turbulence and he's all like, Oh, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's just and of like, course the turbulence is they, they flew. I think they flew over the white lodge, frankly. That's my, <laughs> my theory that there's turbulence when you have to fly over the White Lodge. Exactly. We should have checked on the planetary alignment at that point, but... Seriously. Yeah. Yeah. So they so they get there, and, you know, there's some... As they're driving near the woods, you know, like, the car mal- starts malfunctioning, the radio's getting all staticky, and then goes, you know, uh, all sideways. And then mm-hmm. um, Mulder gets out of his car. Because... From this point on, yes, things might be different. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so here's Mulder essentially being a, very much like a Dale Cooper here, getting yeah. out of his car, doing something very odd. So he gets out, he goes into his trunk, pulls out a spray can, and spray paints this big red X all over the road. And Chris asked me, he's like, "Did Mulder fly with a with with spray paint?" <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Where did he get did the he, spray like, paint? Exactly. Did he stop at the at you know at the hardware store, or did they let him fly with that at the time? <laughs> well, to be fair, you know this was the '90s, so he probably could get away. And being was, yeah. and being a Fed, he probably got through security just fine. He he would have had to keep it in his carry on though, because if that had been in the yeah. belly of the plane, it, he just would have had you know or, orange uh, clothing. Pretty much, pretty much. Yeah. But uh, but it was as it is a good, that was a great observation there. Um. Unless he stopped, like, by a hardware store or something on the That's way. That's what I'm thinking. He must have been like, okay, well, let's stop at the motel, yep. and uh, I'm going to go to the hardware store for a minute. Daddy needs some spray paint for the road. Yeah. <laughs> let's. Okay, we're going to stop at the Lamplighter Inn, and then yes. we're going to stop It's just outside the... of Lewis Fork on a highway. <laughs> on highway, yeah. Oh, oh, you know, you, know, you know what it is? You know where he went? Yeah. Beaumont's hardware store. <gasps> That's exactly. where he went. That's right. 
<laughs> He's at Beaumont's Hardware Store. And he may, ran into Nadine Hurley. <laughs> no, no. Oh, no, from, 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 from Blue Velvet. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I know what you mean. Yeah, that's perfect. He, he, that's perfect. He played, the, he played the numbers game with the with the yeah. guy who's they, blind. They, they, sw- they, swung, they swung by Lumberton. Lumberton, yeah. They swung by Lumberton and went to the Beaumont, Beaumont's Hardware Store. And, right. uh, All right, we, just, we just did an X-Files Twin Peaks Blue Velvet digression there. So we was, did. That's... That's what that's what we're that's we're talking today, Charles, about how everything circles back to Twin it's, Peaks. It's all connected, exactly. So all there. So, so that's what we do, everybody. So mm-hmm. um, so they get there, and um, Mulder arranges for the exhumation of the third victim, Ray Soames, despite despite the protest of Dr. Jay Newman, the county medical examiner. Who is very much the, you know, if I ignore this problem, it will go away, even though all of my daughter's friends are dead. <laughs> yeah, and, and especially since, like, his daughter, right, is driving around with him at the truck, you know, like when they show up. Mm-hmm. And uh, and she's uh, very, very visibly upset about something. Oh, yeah. And yeah. Uh, and the, her father is just kind of blowing her off, like, whatever. Um, and just trying to act all pissed off because they're, they're exhuming this body. Um, so they, they, they finally exhume the body. Uh, they find a deformed body inside that, uh, Scully later concludes is not Soames, but actually she thinks an orangutan. Probably some sort of simian. Yes, exactly. And she finds a metal implant inside the body's nasal cavity. All right, kids. Keep that. Yeah, to, to keep that in the back of your mind because that will come up later. <laughs> oh yeah, like in a lot of episodes. Like in Scully. <laughs> in Scully, yeah, especially season two. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for real. See, Scully has to go away for a while because she gets pregnant in season two. Yeah, and by the real Clyde Bruckman. She had to get abducted because she got pregnant. Mm-hmm. By, yeah, yeah, by the real Clyde Bruckman, not the not the Peter Boyle version. Right, the actual guy. <laughs> Guy. No, that's uh, for real. That was her husband's name, Clyde Bruckman. He was a, he was a cameraman. Oh, seriously? I didn't know that. So, yeah, for real. Yeah, that was. Yeah, she. I was uh, trying to figure out what, what you were referring to, and I was like, oh, yeah, her crap. her first husband was cameraman Clyde Bruckman. I did not know that. I learned something today. That's the father. Yeah, that's the father. That's the father of her daughter Piper. That's funny. And then they named an X Files episode after him. That's funny. In character. Yeah, they did. Was, that was a nice little uh, homage to. Her romance with him. That's hilarious. Yep. All right. Um, I didn't. I didn't learn something today. Uh, so. Um, so yeah, metal implant, very important. Uh, so they go to the, the psychiatric hospital where Soames was committed before his death, and there's like uh, two of Soames' former classmates, the comatose Billy Miles, who's also a player here, and the wheelchair using Peggy O'Dell. And apparently Peg, mm-hmm. Peg has a nosebleed during the agent's visit. And um, and he's, she seemed to have bare those two little dots, like kind of like two little mole shaped. I'm bumps. sorry. His name is Klotz, but he's his name is Clyde. I'm okay. sorry. I okay. apologize. Okay. You looked it Wrong up. Wrong Clyde, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. I did look it up because I was like. Cause I, would think, I, would think, I would think the guy would sue if that was the case. No, they were together when this happened. Okay. All right. Yeah, they were together when that episode happened. But yeah, he um yeah, it was uh yeah, his name was Clyde. That's where that that uh Okay. homage comes from. And um so yeah, he so Peggy has these bumps similar to uh the first victims that we saw at the in the teaser. Mhm. And um which are kind of like moles, kind of like vampire bites, kind of like uh like mosquito, like we kind kind of like mosquito bites, kind of like little tiny hickeys. Yeah, yeah they, I mean yeah. they almost come with like like warts a little bit too. And it's weird because there are sometimes when you're looking at them, sometimes they look like they're three D, and sometimes they just look like they're on the skin. So yeah, it wasn't the greatest effect I think at the time. No, at least not the most consistent one. Yeah. Well, I think it was also on network TV in 1993. I don't think I took I could tell the difference back then. It's only when I got it on a D on an HD TV and DD, DVD that I could figure that out. Yeah, that's true, because it was a little more low-res back then. Yeah. So outside, Mulder says, oh, hey, I'm guessing they've probably been abducted by aliens. And she's like, uh... Uh-huh. So we're, it's like, yeah, okay. So she's probably like, here we go. Because she's saying, this is somebody's sick joke to put, like, a dead monkey in somebody's... Right. 
somebody's casket. She thinks she thinks it's like a prank or something. Or yeah, yeah. And he's saying no. It's because they were abducted and they were sent back with some sort of genetic mutation. That that's why when he's decomposing, he turns into yeah. It becomes an alien autopsy. Yeah, and and I think already by this point, you know, Duchovny and and Anderson are showing some nice chemistry with one another. I mean, they they've got they have a little like a little banner of a, a rhythm going on a little bit. Well, the thing they have in common is they both want to find out what happened. Right. You know, they they both want to find out. They're just approaching it from different styles. Right. They want to find out what happened. And the biggest problem with Mulder as a character, and not as a, it's not a problem, but the biggest problem with Mulder, not as a character, I shouldn't say as a character, as an FBI agent, mm-hmm. is that he has a personal agenda, a very, very strong personal agenda. Um, and it's interesting mm-hmm. because in this episode, he tells the story of his sister's abduction. Yeah. Which is different than when they show his sister's abduction later on in the series. Yeah, and it's in the, the season two premiere, Little Green Men. Right. They show that they were playing Stratego. Risk. Was it Stratego? Yeah, Stratego. I, I couldn't remember if it was Risk or Stratego. They're playing that. And it was like, Stratego, as I'm pointing to one of my, my Stratego Check games. that out. Well, you also have Risk up there, so you can't yeah. give me a hard time for No, um, no, no, no. Not that, they're, very, that. they're very similar. They're very uh, yeah. um, battle-type games. So she, a light comes through the living room window, and she gets pulled out of the house while Mulder watches. So it's interesting that the story is, a little is different. so different. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. it's, it's, again, you know, I'm sure – Chris Carter probably rethought some things, or especially when they're like, "Well, hey, we got to make this a full episode, or like a good chunk and, of the episode." And it's it's the pilot too. Yeah, you know, yeah. they didn't even know if this show was going to be a show. That's true. You know, so, things you know, change. All of what, yeah, all of what we're saying is twenty twenty, but uh, yeah, exactly. We're we we're, we're approaching this from the hindsight that, hey, you know, they the show lasted for nine years plus another two. In in a return, so yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and after two movies as well, mm-hmm. nine years, two movies, and two seasons of. Uh, That's easy for you to say. Did you hear me, David Lynch? Two seasons of a return. Two seasons. <laughs> I'm talking to you, Mark Frost. Yep, exactly. I see what you did so, there. Yeah. 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 It's well, like, it's not... You're not going to let Chris Carter show you up, are you, Lynch? Frost? No, uh-uh. and you guys? No. Uh. Uh-uh. Okay. You can't Just do see. that. You're David freaking Lynch, okay? Yeah, you can do what you want. Yeah, do what you want, and you should want this. Exactly. Because, she wanted. She wanted bad. Because I want this. <laughs> what do you mean, you? We? We want this. <laughs> we. I hate us both. <laughs> <laughs> I see dead people. Anyway, all right. Get out or I'll tell my dad or nice. I'll kill you. <laughs> nice. All right. Um, boy, that took a really dark turn all of a sudden. Well, you know, I just wanted to go back to uh, yeah. Naomi Watts' fantastic yes. audition with yes. Chad Everett. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, still, we're still kind of resonating from the Mulholland Drive uh, discussion yeah. a little bit. We're still, we're still mulling that over in our brains. We still have those quotes just bopping around in there. <laughs> We're still mauling Mulholland Drive. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Look at that pun. Yeah. Nice job. Yep. Yeah. Anyway. All right. Um, so they end up going out to the forest, not Ghostwood Forest, because, you know, I wonder if they run into Jerry Horn. You know, that is so bizarre that – oh, here it comes. Yeah, you got to wait I'm for so it. Sorry. I think I'm high. <laughs> you would think – that David Patrick Kelly would have been in an X Files episode. Yeah, he was not. Right, I looked. I know. I, <laughs> I was, was like, I was disappointed. I was like, was he in one? He he had now, to have been in now, one. He's... Now his brother Ben is. I know Richard Bamer is which in an X Files episode. That's one of those that we're going to be talking about. We're gonna do, we're gonna do that bad boy. That's, that's for sure. That's where but... we're gonna wrap up our uh, our uh, X Files uh, yep. Odyssey with. But uh, yeah, David Patrick Kelly. So I looked up David Patrick Kelly. Yeah. I, I Googled him basically like I just did I did Google David Patrick Kelly X Files yeah. and one of the questions <laughs> in the Google yeah. search results was who says warriors come out and play? <laughs> 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 I was like, that's awesome. <laughs> that's probably the most 
That's probably the most uh, iconic Googled question that gets you David Patrick Kelly as an answer. Well, yes, come out and play. Come out to play. Yeah. Yeah. Why'd you kill Cyrus? I don't know. I just like doing stuff like that. He's so crazy. He's so good. I love you, David Patrick Kelly. Anyway, um, <laughs> they're yeah, coming, so they're, they're they're coming the back. They're out in the woods. Yeah. And it's they're celebrating they're celebrating their graduation, meaning yeah. I guarantee you there's weed and alcohol involved in this situation. Pretty much, pretty much. Which is probably why their parents are half pissed in the first place. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So um Scully discovers some strange ash on the ground. Mm -hmm. She thinks it's cult activity. It's cult activity because there's just like they're out there burning something. Right. Yeah, they're burning one. All right. <laughs> they're blazing one. More they're like. blazing it up. I'm, t I'm telling you. It's Oregon. Exactly. Um, so a uh, local detective arrives and orders them to leave. And so they go back to their motel. That's a great scene, though, because you, you hear this sort of un identified noise and then lights and it looks very similar to the beginning where mm -hmm. you see someone get picked up by a light and you know they they see lights and a silhouette and it's like what are you doing here this is private property yeah but uh, here you know it, it really establishes the tone at least as far as a visual tone because you know they're out at night in the woods and mm -hmm. you know it just it has this very dark mysterious feel very much like twin peaks very much like twin peaks yeah there's no there's no you know, all you needed would be like, um, a, you know, like a point of view shot holding a flashlight bouncing up and around. That's all you need. Or you need a little circle of stones with some gross black oil It'd be in next it. near some sycamore trees. Exactly. Yeah. If you were under a sycamore tree, I'd be like, that's it. This is this is X-Files, Twin Peaks, Inception, mic drop. We're done here. Exactly. Um, so they encounter a flash of light at uh, the spot their car had malfunctioned earlier, and Mulder is ecstatic about this. Mm -hmm. He's very excited. Because he's like, we lost nine minutes, yes! And he's kind of fist-pumping over the lost time. Just disappear, what the hell happened? Yeah, it's like, like I said, Mulder, I feel like Mulder as a character is okay with putting himself at risk because of his personal agenda. Right, well, especially early on because he's so much more reckless. He's so much more reckless, and he's so. And, and but that's why he's, Scully compliments him as well because she to, she reins it reins him in a little bit. She reins him in, and he opens her mind. They're very yin and yang of each other, but he is very reckless, almost to the point of wanting to be abducted. I think if he, I think he feels like if he gets abducted, he will figure out what happened to his sister. Yeah. Something else I noticed while I was watching the pilot, you notice he's already eating his sunflower seeds. Yeah, that was gross. So, yeah, that's – he's always you know, picking those out. And... I don't like sunflower seeds that are still in the shell, you know. I mean, it's it, it's it, it's fine. I mean, you get the saltiness, and then I just would rather just, you know, pour them in a little cup and just, you know, knock them back personally. Okay. Do it all at once? Yeah. Okay. I will eat a peanut in a shell, though. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. And uh, I don't mind a – pistachio in a shell but it's not something i would do while i was driving yeah you don't want to you know what i really like um pumpkin seeds that were like baked in the oven oh those with, are amazing with, with salted with salt yes. yes those are really good that is delicious i like those yeah pumpkin like, seeds in their shell got, salted roasted crunchy shell yeah, yeah i got i kind of got it um oh. into those when uh they, they made some in when we were in boy scouts so that was my first introduction to that my mom my mom always made them when we when we did jack-o'-lanterns we would save the yeah a lot of people wash them off and then do that so yeah, yeah that's cool but yeah oh when is it gonna be fall charles it needs to be autumn <laughs> yeah halloween's gonna suck this year though halloween is gonna suck and i man i mean i want to stupid wanna, corona i want to give kids candy yeah not this year i want the kids I want the kids to come to my house with their awesome costumes and, and pick some candy while I project movies onto my. Uh, yeah, maybe that maybe their iPads will come by and you know they. Yeah, seriously. Do it, do it virtually. <laughs> yeah, their parents will come with like those those extendo reacher things that you use to get things off of sh high shelves. Right. They'll come with a mask and say like, oh, "Do you have any Snickers in this bowl? Just put one in my you know." 
Well, you remember the South Park episode that the, the Shining uh, nod, where they take Kyle uh, into around and um, because Kyle can't go out for Halloween or whatever, so they so they they're using him like they have his face on a uh, iPad. I don't remember this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's pretty funny. And they, they, yeah. they, but they have him like on a like a sort of body, and they kind of wheel that around. And you know, I just it, we finally have a Halloween where people are ready, you know, to have they will have gotten their baby Yoda costumes together, and I'm going to see none of it. Yeah. It's well, not, maybe it's not maybe good. maybe pay, people will take pictures from inside their houses or something. I hope so. Yeah. Um, anyway. Wear your mask, people, so we can have freaking Halloween. Pretty much. Pretty much. We have to really hurry that one up, though. I know. Because uh, I don't think it's going to happen this year. They say if we all wore our masks for six weeks, we'd be fine. Well, we'd have to start now because it's like middle well, of, middle of August already. So Do it, everybody. Yeah, better hurry. Uh, get on that, people. Uh, so they go back to the motel. Mulder tells Scully that is about his sister, Samantha, vanishing. You talked about that. And uh, then they get a call, anonymous call, saying that Odell's dead. So they go back and uh, they see Odell's body, but no wheelchair. Someone mm -hmm. saw her running. Yeah, she was killed running into traffic. So the what? woman that was in the wheelchair, yeah, running into traffic. How does that work? So then they go back to their motel, but hey, it's on fire. And all the evidence that they accumulated is... All the x-rays and pictures, as Mulder says. Yeah, he kind yeah. of like overacts that one a little bit. He has a little, he has a little bit of a, of a tantrum about that. However, yes. Scully kept the implant in her pocket. Yeah, she did. So that, yeah, that was, that's her survived. That's her big play, but uh, she doesn't reveal, re reveal that until the toward the end of the episode. Yep, there goes my computer. Mm hmm. Yep, which was a big deal back then. Um, yeah, she had one of those like four inch thick laptops. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. They probably weighed like fifty pounds. Yeah, it probably weighed like seriously. It probably did weigh like eight pounds or something. Like yeah. That. <laughs> but that was high tech, man. That was. I mean. The, um, almost it weighed almost as much as their cell phones back then. Oh my gosh! Yeah. The, the big brick, I was telling, brick phones. I I was telling Chris that my friend Shelly and I, when we would meet people, yeah, who had cell phones, we didn't call them cell phones. We called them Mulder phones. Nice. I would say, hey, I met this guy, and he has a Mulder phone. You know, That's cool. That's cool. So many people. I I swear the X Files got more people carrying cell phones than anything. I'm sure it helped. I mean, because it ma it mainstreamed it, I'm sure. Yeah, it sure did. Yeah. It was like, wait, you can carry phones around. Okay, that's cool. You never saw them charge them, though. That was the one bait and switch that they gave us. Right. And those old phones, those those had a charge for like six hours. Yeah. <laughs> that's funny. Ah, the 90s. The 90s. So, uh, so apparently uh, Nemin's daughter, Teresa, contacts uh, Mulder and Scully. She says uh, she woke up in the middle of the woods several times, and uh, although her father and uh, Detective Miles revealed uh, who turns out to be Billy Miles' father, show up and they take her away. Mm hmm And so Mulder and Scully go back to the cemetery to exhume the other victims, only to find oh, their graves have already been dug up and their coffins are missing. They're already gone. Somebody's already taken them. Yep, and at this so point, oh, go ahead. The one thing I don't understand about this episode, yeah, what is this town hiding? Is it just? It's a good question. We don't really get all the answers. Now we do kind of get a little bit more answers in later episodes, like the ones I was talking about, Requiem and others. Yeah, yeah, but we don't really. But at don't this really point, know. We don't know. We don't know who these. You know, this is this is. In for all intents and purposes, this is just a medical examiner yeah. and a sheriff, not anybody who we would think would be connected with the FBI or connected with the X Files or yeah. connected with you know the Blue Rose Task Force or whatever. <laughs> yeah, it's just people in authority that are doing some shady stuff, but we're not quite sure what they're really. They're up just to. trying to keep the FBI out of their out of their quiet little beach community, is what I'm thinking. Maybe. I'm thinking they're just trying to keep their kids from seeming like crazy people or get drawing attention to this because it is their kids. Yeah. So. 
That's, that's, I mean, that's, I think that's a good logical uh, way to um, yeah. explain this, mm-hmm. um, that they are being protective, especially, I mean, especially Billy's father, because as we find out later, hey, Billy was the, Billy did it, so. Billy did it, and will somebody please explain to me how this hospital has no surveillance and no locks on the doors? Like, how yeah. does Billy get out at night? E- even in the 90s, they had at least closed circuit TV. Back then. I mean, I have seen Terminator 2, okay? I know that mental hospitals can be extremely well-equipped with video surveillance, and I want to know why this one wasn't. Yeah. I mean, even if David Bowie shows up on the videotape. He was never here. <laughs> so I don't understand. That's one thing I don't understand about this episode. How is Billy getting out? Because yeah. And nobody noticing. Yeah. There's that one nurse that his, that is his primary caregiver yeah. who it just basically gets off work at nine and then Billy's just left to his own devices. Apparently he's got a key or something. Yeah. I don't know. Well, here's the, here's the funny part with when Billy, when Mueller's checking out Billy, he notices like there's all this dirt and, you know, dried mud and whatnot on his, over his feet. Scully finds those ashes on his feet. Yeah. You know, there's like all this yeah. stuff and. The same like, ash she like he's, found. He, he's like there for all of five place. minutes and notices this, but none of the hospital staff notices this. Does anyone ever bathe him? Or, right. And if they do bathe, if, and, he, and this is not the first time he's obviously, obviously not the first time he's gotten out. Yeah. So are they just not washing his feet or are they just thinking like, you know, oh, Billy's dirty again. Like, how did he get dirty? He doesn't walk. <laughs> like, it doesn't make this is an incredibly inept hospital staff is all I'm saying. It must be somebody just, you know, putting dirt on him. I don't know. I don't get it. Seriously. I think I think this I think this mental ward is being run by Dr. Jacoby. <laughs> somebody completely unqualified to be sandling patients. Those miserable Fs are at it again. Do you know where patients are? Exactly. Just... Do, you, do you know where your patients are? That's awesome. Um that's, yeah, it's, that's, it's, it's just doesn't that, make a lot of sense. That's magic. Um <laughs> it is, it's magic. Uh, so, um, Millie, so Mulder figures out, well, Billy's the one responsible. And, uh, so they go back to the woods and there they encounter Detective Miles, but they hear a scream and then they find Billy nearby with Teresa in his arms. Mm -hmm. And then we get a very kind of like X-Files pilot iconic moment where you see this big flash of light, the wind circling around, like the leaves are blowing all the way around Billy. In a circular pattern, mm-hmm. like a little bit of a, a vortex going. Yeah, and I actually think that this clip was used yeah. in uh, the CNN documentary series about the 90s, the episode of television. I think this yeah. is the – I think that's the clip they actually yeah. used. It's but, extremely – you're right. It's extremely iconic for X-Files. Yeah, I mean it, it pretty much just kind of like – pretty much exemplifies the X-Files in just this one shot. Mm-hmm. Um, something yeah. supernatural, and it is it is very visually arresting and very cool, um, yeah. especially for the '90s. And but you know, Billy and Teresa they they're recovered unharmed, and then we pick up like a couple of weeks later where Billy's going through hypnosis performed by a Heights Werber, and Mulder's in the room with him while Scully's watching from you know from behind one of those one way mirrors, mm-hmm. and. Hey, who's there but Cigarette Smoking Man and uh, yeah. Division Chief Blevins? And watch, watching all this going on. And Billy confesses that, hey, he and his friends were having a party. Party on, dudes. And, and they were celebrating the graduation. Then they saw the first bright light. And it transported him to a location he calls the testing place. They took us to the testing place. Yes, exactly. There was a convenience store. They lived above it. They lived above it. The testing place is probably above a convenience yes, store. Exactly. If you go to the ship, like the lower level is probably like the commissary where you can like buy sandwiches at two in the morning. Yes. Yeah. So in case you hadn't figured out, it's really easy to connect Twin Peaks to, to X-Files. That's Very, what we do. That's what we do. Even when there's absolutely no reason for that connection, we will make that nope, connection. We'll find it. We'll just we'll just make we'll just pull one out of the air. We'll, we'll just, make it up. We'll just make shit up. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. Uh, um, creative license, right? So mm-hmm. uh, so um, apparently there's a group there that um, told him to gather the others so they could do tests, and the group um, put the implant in his nasal cavity, 
and he would wait for the light to give their orders to him. So they had him in a in in waking sleep stasis until they were ready for him to yeah. collect people. But why did it take so long to get everybody? Because this was four years ago. Yeah, something and like that. There what, were there seven kids. And uh, I'm not sure how many kids there were. There were uh, there were a decent amount of kids, and it's just like yeah. What what? Why are they taking so long? <laughs> I know, right? Well, there's probably they probably have abducted other kids, and they they're going to others. It's like, oh, we did that Oregon kid this year. We got to go do the um, the the Iowa kid. Let's go get him. Yeah, so maybe they're just like cross crossing all across the country, or yeah, who knows? Maybe yeah. they had like a limited staff. We don't know. Um, so. Sorry. <laughs> you know, maybe they have budget cuts. Who knows? Wherever there's kids drinking beer in the woods on the night of graduation, there's alien abductions probably. <laughs> yeah. UFOs will be there to uh Yeah, to, exactly. To, to uh, wherever, abduct those wherever, kids. Wherever there's a kid sneaking into the woods to, to, to do bong hits, I'll be there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um so uh apparently though the uh test didn't work and they wanted everything destroyed. So Yep. Uh, though they say they were leaving, Billy's now afraid that they're going to come back. And um, the hypnotist tells him not to be afraid, assures them that the FBI are only trying to help. And, of course, all this is going on while the cigarette smoking man's all whisper, 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 whisper to um, mm-hmm. to Blevins. And uh, they leave and Scully follows and Mulder looks directly at the mirror at her. Mm-hmm. And she stops. So, like, she knows that he's looking right at her, even, oh, though, yeah. even though he's not supposed to be able to see her there. And, um, he, yeah. yeah, and then he leaves. So, kind of does, kind of gives, he's doing his, uh-huh, see what I'm talking, this is what I'm talking about right here. Yeah. And see, that's the thing about Mulder is he's approaching his work from well, he's taking it too personally adoles- for one, he's too personally and he's right because he has the personal agenda and i think he's approaching it a little bit from the adolescent mind that he had when it happened for him because he was 12 mm-hmm. when his sister was taken and he's not the cynic yet that he becomes right because we find out later through the X-Files that this is not alien abduction. This is the government, like, pretending to do alien abduction. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is, this is smoke that, and that, mirrors. That's, that's all cover-up for, for the real agenda. Right, right. I mean, there is some real alien stuff going on. Yeah, because they're into, like, human hybrids, human-alien right, hybrids. Into, right, like the whole Roswell thing happened. And and that's kind of um, what, it, what ex- the, the later explanation for – that body they found that kind of looked like a orangutan is because right. the the that Soames was one of the alien human alien hybrids. He's thought he's one of the hybrids, right? And so, and is, so, so you know, we Billy. find out. Yeah, we find out later that there is actual alien stuff going on, but there's not as much of it as we think. Um, and you know, the cigarette smoking man is behind a lot of it. You know, like there's that episode where it's Christmas. Mm-hmm. And it, the they have the alien, and it's him and Deep Throat, and one of them has to shoot the alien, and Deep Throat won't do it, and so the Cancer Man does it, and right. so you know we find we find that out. But a lot of what we think is alien abduction is you know aliens just came here. I mean they they they're not abducting us. That's the government. <laughs> yeah, exactly. and Mulder is not seeing that yet, even though there's so much evidence to somebody in the you know in the government pulling the strings. He's too tunnel visioned by his personal agenda. Well, I think he, I think you made a really great observation about um, Mulder. Still, essentially, he's still that same twelve, thirteen year old kid that mm-hmm. watched his sister being abducted. Right, and he never grew out of that. He still feels like he's, and we we know this from later episodes how tormented he is by that moment. It's it's right. it's the it's the single most thing that drives him to to find out to to try to understand what the hell happened to his sister so that um so it it you know in a lot of ways he you know 
kind of like you know people have made the, the that kind of comparison about Batman that Batman is still essentially that angry eight year old kid that lost his parents in an alleyway, right? And that's kind right. of what Mulder is. He's the, he's still that twelve year old kid that lost his sister to an alien abduction, and it's only he through... lost his sister and and his family. Really, it tore his family apart because. Well, there's things we find out later, but, you know, the, like I said, the pilot's description of that night is different than the reenactment that we see in the next season where they're playing Stratego and he watches her and he tries to grab onto her and she's screaming, Fox, help me. And he can't do it. Yeah. So here he is, the older brother that can't protect his little sister. And then his parents have to come home and say, where's your sister, buddy? And he has to say there was a light and she was taken out the window and I don't know what happened. Yeah. And then we find out even later that his father knew this was going to happen. His And, and his mother realizes that this is what happened as well, that they went out that night because they knew this was going to be the night. That exactly. Well, there was like, um, if I re- recall correctly, there was a there was going to be there was a choice. And that that had to did Dad made. ever ask you if you had a favorite? Right, exactly. And so the the question is, well, did Mil, Bill Mulder choose Fox or did he choose Samantha? According to Mulder's mother, he chose Samantha. Right. He said, um, he said, did Dad ever ask you if you had a favorite? And he, she said, it was your father's choice, and I have hated him ever since. That's why his parents are divorced. Right. Yeah. You know, I don't. I mean, I would friggin' murder. <laughs> yeah, my husband. Yeah, understandable. So if he had done that. Yeah, but I, I, I mean, I would, yeah. I would murder my husband, and then I would murder the. Yeah, you know. Yeah, and then, Mulder's, Mulder's mom knows a heck of a lot more than she's talking about. You know. Well, and you know, you feel bad for Mulder's mom because she, I mean, yes, yeah, she's a little complicit in this because she knew, but. Um, I don't she, think she knew she, it was going to happen that night. I think she, I think she knew that. Well, she probably pieced it together. Yeah, I think she knew something was going on. Probably what happened is Bill probably did say, yeah. you know, you know, which one of your kids is our favorite. You know that that sort yeah. of a discussion which is, is is interesting because you know I don't have kids, but I have a really good friend that has three kids. Yeah. And I'm not their mom, and I can't pick a favorite. Yeah. You know. I, I love them for their own reasons in this, you know, I love them for their own reasons and I can't pick a favorite. There's one that I have. I'm the same way about my nieces and nephews. So, yeah. yeah, it's like you might have, you know, one thing in common with one and then another thing in common with the other, but it's not like, but if there was, one's a, your favorite. if there was a choice, like, okay, which one of these do you have to sacrifice? I couldn't make that choice. I'd shoot myself in the head first. Yeah, pretty much. You know? yeah, that, yeah. I was like, okay, my choice is I'm going to take myself out. How's that? Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, it's that's a that's an interesting thing, and so I think after that being pieced together, and then her coming home, and she's probably thinking, "Oh, is this why we went to dinner tonight?" Right? Did you did you know this was you know? Because she, like I said, she knows a lot more than she's letting on. And I and I and I did think about the X Files, and I think we talked about this. Yeah. Um, with Betty Briggs. Pulling something out of the the back of the chair. Yeah, in the return. In the return. Yeah, reminded me so much of Mulder's mother hiding the alien killing device in the lamp in their house. Yes, you did. Yeah, you did make that comparison. Yeah. So go back to the go go dig that one out. uh, Ghostwood Files. Yeah, Uh, there you go. (laughs) There you go. Uh, So yeah, that was a good. That's going back a ways. Um, But yeah, you did make that comparison, as I recall correctly. Um, so we, we pick up in Blevins office really quickly. Um, Scully basically gives her report to the division chief. Mm-hmm. And he's like, you have no proof that any of this happened. She's like, well, yeah, but bam. <laughs> yeah, exactly. She pulls. So yeah, there's like, she, she says that like, I can't substantiate anything, but, uh, in, you know, the, the division chief says, yeah, yeah, you don't have no evidence. And she's like, oh, really? Mm-hmm. Like, you, like you said, and, and pulls out that implant and sits down and goes, there you go. 
And um, so you know, whoever started that fire, just you know, they've they've been taken out by the FBI. It's like, look, oh yeah, yeah, you like thing you needed to burn up. <laughs> pretty much, and I'm sure. I'm sure it was probably the uh, CSM that uh, killed them. Probably. Also, and that thing, like, would that even burn? You know, that that piece of it alien would, it technology. Would, it would. Maybe, uh -huh. Yeah, it's a good question because we don't know how, if it was heat resistant or not. But yeah, I don't know uh, if it would even burn. Um, so. Unless it would melt, I don't know. But I kind of we yeah. don't know what the melting point would be. Um, I have no idea. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, she she says there's like no real crimes have been committed, and um, and uh, Blevins rhetorically asked like, well, how did we prosecute the crim criminals when there's like no basis in reality here? Mm -hmm. And, yeah, how do we prosecute that? Yeah, exactly. So um, that's the problem with the X Files is that you have yeah. you you quote unquote solve a case, yeah, but you can't bring anybody. You can't to prosecute justice. it. Yeah, exactly. That's right. That's it's rare, exactly. That's what like Twin Peaks. That's a good point because yeah, you nobody it, yeah nobody like, really goes to trial in Twin Twin Peaks. Yeah, how are you going to arrest Bob? Yeah, you know. The closest, I mean, the closest you got was Leland Paul, or excuse me, Ben Horn, who was under suspicion. Right, and even when you did find out it was Leland Palmer, yeah, you know they 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 smoke Bob out of him, and he and it winds up killing Leland. Right. So they avoided it, the nice, you know, they, hey, we avoided that trial. Yeah, nice and, and so neat. you have you you know like in Twin Peaks, you have a case where you know what happened. You know who did it, mm -hmm. but it's not anything you can put in a report. I and mean, you, can, you, can you, can't, it, you can't prove it. You yeah. can't prove it. I mean, you can put it in your Blue Rose Task Force report, and Gordon Cole is going to say, you know, this doesn't get any bluer, but. <laughs> That's funny. Blue Rose. It doesn't get any bluer. Nope. You can't tell the rest of the town we definitively have Laura Palmer's killer. Yeah. Because, you know, because you don't. Even Wyndham Earl. You yeah. know, even Wyndham Earl gets sucked into the lodge. Right. And he doesn't get prosecuted for any of the crap there, he did. There's like zero accountability here because. No, there's absolutely no public. There's no there's no public closure. Again, any, it, any again, how 2020 is this? Oh, God, for real. Right. So, so, but so essentially, the X Files is nine se seasons of complete frustration, especially on Fox Mulder's part, because he. he can't... That's the thing, especially if they have, if there's anything in their annual review about how many cases you've closed and how right. many people you brought to justice. It's like, well, you found the fluke man, but he's not in prison right now. They even say that in in the fluke in the episode yeah. fluke, which is yeah. quite possibly my favorite episode of the, of the X Files. That one, I like that one. I, I do like Clyde, Clyde Brockman's Fine Repose. Yeah. And I really like Eve. That's another good one. That's a, that is a good one. That's a good one. And the one we're the you know the the one we're going to discuss with Michael hum, J. Anderson. Humbug, yeah. Humbug, humbug is fantastic. Yeah. Um, but I really like the fluke episode, and they have the fluke man. They have him captured, and even Mulder says, "Was it the host? Was that called the host? The host? I thought it was called fluke. I'm not sure. Maybe it's host. I don't remember. Yeah. Um, I'm going to look that up." We're only we're only uh, tangentially talking X Files. This is an X Files podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no, right? So I don't have all this in my brain. So the they have him. They have they've they've caught him and they have him in a cell of some sort. Yeah. And they're trying to figure out what they're going to do. And and Mulder's like, you can't prosecute this. This is not a man. This is not someone you can rehabilitate. This is right. a creature. There's nothing to do, and that's like Bob. It was called the host, by the way. It was second it was episode, the okay. second episode of season two, right after Little Green Men. Okay. So. Okay. Yeah, with what's his name from Battlestar Galactica? Yeah. From the new Battlestar Galactica. Um. So you you have all you know. There's you know there's things like tombs and people like that that yeah. you that get prosecuted and um. But there's always some sort of supernatural thing that is, you know, that kills them or they, they that they keep killing while they're in prison. Yeah, it's, there's yeah, a, it's every, very, you know, nothing is there isn't that sense of closure with anything. 
no, you can't you can't definitively say yeah. we closed this case because and even though Scully at the end of this she does her little Doogie Hauser thing on the computer and types up her report and she says that the that the case is closed. So so Blevins asks uh, anyway, yeah. Scully or uh, what Scully thinks Mulder thinks about the case. And mm-hmm. and, and she says, well, um, Mulder believes aliens are responsible. So yeah, she's that's, not, that's, that's, that sets the tone right there. She's not lying. You know, she's not keeping Mulder's secrets for him. No. And, you know, she doesn't say that she agrees with it. She just said, no. she's just basically like giving a flat report here. Mm-hmm. Um, this is my report. This is Mulder's report. And it is what it is. And so after that, you know, she leaves. Cigarette smoking man comes in, takes the implant. Presumably, because we don't see him actually take it, and uh, Scully. Well, we see him have it later. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then Scully later on lies awake at night, and uh, she gets a phone call from Mulder, who tells her that case file on Billy Miles disappeared from the district attorney's office. Again, just no accountability here. Nope, nope. And uh, Mulder wants to talk to her. And Scully agrees they'll talk it over, talk about it tomorrow. They'll talk in the morning, yes. Yeah, exactly. And that's kind of where we leave them. Mulder, and yeah, and the, and the cigarette smoking man takes the takes the implant into a large warehouse. Yes. And In Area 51, apparently. And, and Raiders of the Lost Arcs it. Yeah. <laughs> in with a thing with other ones. So they yes. have all of the implants from all of the kids, apparently, except for the – but see, now that's what I'm wondering. Is it all of those kids? Or is it other test subjects? Because obviously the one kid got buried with this stuff yeah. in him. Yeah. Well, we knew of like four. Did they miss that one? There like, was like, what? that was like the fourth one that, you know, he puts in there. Yeah. I don't know who the others are because I don't necessarily think they're all those kids because obviously Billy still had his. Yeah. And it's not like anybody looked for it. And... What is up with the medical examiner that he didn't find that? Well, I, I think it was all just a lot of these town elders. They're essentially trying to cover this up. It's this this big cover up because you had well, there's you, probably, you had there's, you had the 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 te- detective involved. You had the coroner. You had the medical examiner. Yeah, there's this town probably has a Dougie Milford in yeah. it somewhere that knows that something weird is going on in. You know, right. the evil in these woods, for lack of a better term. Right. That has been telling everybody, just keep this quiet. Don't, don't leak, you know, don't, you know, keep, yeah, keep everybody keep, else keep, out of keep it. Keep this from leaking out. or Keep this from leaking out. You know, this is a nice town. These are good people. Don't freak people out. Because all you're going to do is draw attention and then, mm-hmm. then we'll be in more trouble. And then all of a sudden the FBI is here asking questions. Mm-hmm. Would have gotten away with it if it wasn't for you, you, those, pes- those pesky FBI agents. Yeah. Why did you shoot me? Because you came here. I'm not going back to jail. <laughs> That's hilarious. It's my, it's my, it's my bad Josie impression. Thank you very much. Nice. But yeah, like I said, there's probably a Doug, uh, probably a, a Douglas Milford somewhere that is part of, not necessarily Blue Rose, but part of what was it? What was it called that they were part of? That. Uh... Oh, you mean Project Blue Book. Blue, blue book. Yes, that's it. Couldn't think of it. I knew it wasn't blue rose. It was yeah. blue something. In a, yeah, project yeah. project blue. There's rose. probably some project blue book thing going on in this town. Yeah, well, especially with, you know, if involving the UFOs, because hey, that's what Project Blue Book was supposed to investigate, right? Well, and that's for the, the, for, the I mean, for the Air this, Force. If this town has been seeing that for a while, you know how long how long has this been going? Has it been since Roswell that this town has seen weird stuff? You know. I'm still of the opinion that uh, Major Briggs and Dana Scully's father are the same guy. They're the same guy. I oh, mean, they're, sure they're, they're, they're the definitely guy. played by the same actor. Oh yeah. But yeah. I think they're the exact same guy. I think I I think I think that uh, he has Major, a second Major, family yes, in Major, Washington D.C. Major Briggs has a second family. <laughs> he has a he has, he has a family in Washington D.C. Yeah. and Washington State, and he's disappointed in both kids. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And he faked his death in the yeah he faked episode his we're gonna death. In, in, to Scully, and so yeah, then, yes. that's he it. faked his death so he could go. He could go live with Betty Briggs. Yes, I'm, yep. I'm st- I have spoken. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll die on this hill. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Prove me wrong. 
Yeah, prove me wrong, Internet. Coffee <laughs> sips my coffee. All right, so yeah, they're, um, and they're, they're both in the military. Are they both? Are they both? Is it the same branch of the military? I don't even remember. I want to say that Scully's father was Navy. Okay, and Major Briggs and is Major Air Force. Air Force, yeah. So yeah. okay, but again, you know, hey, if he's giving a false identity already, what's to say he was really with the Navy? I saw Catch Me If You Can. You can just go to any uniform store and buy that crap. Army Navy stores, you know. Yeah, seriously, you know. We had one in uh, where in the small town I grew up in Medina, so we had a we had a great one in uh, on campus, and it just recently closed. They're, they're cool stores. I love I love digging through that stuff. It was yeah, a, they, a lot of fun. I, I used to buy uh, like my winter coats there because. Like an actual pea coat, you because they get those big survival jackets and everything too. Well, yeah, or like if you get like an actual, I had a I had a French naval coat that mm-hmm. I I could wear in sub zero temperature and be sweating. It was unbelievable. Yeah, it was fantastic. Um, so yeah, I like that. I like that theory, I, and I am sure that we go on the internet and look hard enough, harder than I care to try to. Yes, we will find Major Briggs. And uh, Dane Scully's father, fan fiction, as being the same guy. Yep. You know, I'm sure it's out there. So, I'm sure it's out there. Yeah. So, so if you know of any, what is his name? What is what is his name? I don't even remember off the top of my head. <laughs> I don't know, but we're going to talk about it. We're going to find out because we're going to. I don't remember. We're going to talk. Rank. We're going to talk about that episode, so we'll find out. Yeah, I don't remember his rank either. So yeah, we'll find out. Um, so uh, what's your rating for this episode? Do you have a rating? Oh yeah, we should rate this episode. I would. St- Say as pilots go, mm-hmm. I I am going to give this nine out of ten inexplicable cans of spray paint in the trunk. Nice, because as far as a pilot goes, mm-hmm. now some of this is hindsight. Like I said, the fact that this the, the, the fact that the cancer man is in this, yeah, is wonderful. I think that's fantastic, and I remember seeing this pilot and wanting to watch more of this show which is a sign of a great pilot which is a sign of a good pilot i wanted to know more about these characters i wanted to see more of these kinds of stories i liked the concept that there are people in the fbi who have the resources to research this kind of stuff but that there's a credibility issue you know i i i I wanted to see more of the show and so as as pilots go it was a pretty good one. Yeah, I mean, you have two likable leads. You've yep. got a lot of great, interesting, and grossing mystery, a lot of which is unresolved that makes you want to see more. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, the, again, you know, great atmosphere because it had that, a little bit of a Twin Peaks vibe to the, yep. pro- to the production. And, um, and hey, yeah. we don't have Mark Frost, but we have Mark Snow. <laughs> yes, so. that's true. And... Yeah, we we definitely. I mean, obviously, you know, Mark Snow. You know, Twin Peaks is kind of um, symbolized a lot by you know its great music, especially you know an, the great Angelo Badalamenti score. Yeah, and the X Files is definitely like that with Mark Snow's score. Oh yeah, which are mm-hmm. so haunting, and yeah. and capture the mood of the show perfectly. You know, right. but but being obviously something completely different from Twin Peaks as completely well. Completely different, yes. But a fant- fantastic theme song and yeah. everything. And, and you know, I've got one of his. Um, I think it was the first score album that came out of his mm-hmm. for the X Files. Yeah. Yep. Um, and uh, it's just amazing, and just it's one of those soundtracks that um, if you ever wanted to do a haunted house, that's a good one. It's a great one to play. For it to, yeah. to make it, you know, like if you wanted to, you know, come up with a haunted house, you know, really creepy music. It's perfect for mm-hmm. that. Yep. What's your rating, Charles? Uh, we're in sync. I give this one 9 out of 10 as well, but I'm going to give it I'm pretty close to yours. I'm giving it 9 out of 10 spray painted X's on the road. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. I was going to do that or important nasal implants. See, that's the thing. I felt like the nasal implant was a little too obvious. Yeah. So that's why I went with spray painted X's on the road. That works. Yeah. Um, and hey, it's X-Files, right? So uh, we have some feedback, believe it or not. Yes! We have not one, but two. So first one, coming in all the way from Milan, Italy. I wonder who that is. I know, right? DJ Nick writing in. 
Heck yeah. Heck yeah, because uh, he's the one that's been like, you guys got to do an X-Files podcast. Yeah, he's been well, he's been prodding us for a while on that one. So I uh, hope this uh, satisfied that a little bit. Daryl so, Charles and Zan, please keep nerding it up. Love yeah. DJ Nick from Malin. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so he starts off first with the um, asterisk, you know, uh, saying, selects a cigarette and lights up. Oh, look, look at him being yes. the cancer man. Exactly. So I guess... Yeah, I guess he's the um, the cigarette smoking man to our Mulder and Scully. I guess that is not who you want to be in this series. No, I no, mean, come on. No, this is, this is not. No, this is yeah. uh, the Nick's taking his claim. Apparently, though. Yeah, that's of all the people you're gonna identify with. Uh, that would not be my first choice. That's not my first choice, but you know, it is. It is creepy, and it's a it's a good way to set the mood. Exactly. So he's probably like, flick. Uh, yeah. <sighs> Yeah. Very uh very, very Raymond very Raymond Burr in uh rear window. <laughs> yeah. I could gush for hours about a show that meant and means so much to me, but I will keep it as brief as possible. Uh it all happened in a pokey little office where spooky Mulder met the beautiful, incredibly beguiling Dana Scully. From there an everlasting romance with these characters and their adventures began for me. Mm-hmm. Though both actors' performances may seem a little wooden at times, I do believe that is part of their charm. The show fired on all cylinders and from the get-go, abductions, alien experiments, major government conspiracies, and so much more. I am completely honest when I say I greatly envy this brief yet intense journey you two will be undertaking when it comes to the X-Files, as no show, with the exception of Doctor Who, has ever had me this spellbound and and I, for one, or excuse me, and one I return to often. Maybe someday I will be able to twist the arms of two of, of Ohio's finest podcasters. Look at him buttering us up. Mm. Uh, to brave flattery will get you everywhere, pal. Yeah, yeah pretty much. Um, uh, we can be bribed. We can be bought. Uh, to brave this through this series with me, he he. So, mm-hmm. so here he is trying to like, uh, maybe is he trying I, to get us. I think he is. I think that, oh, man. I think that was his opening salvo. Uh, right. From this meantime, this X file, you know, like X file. Uh, thanks XP you. Gr- file. XP file. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thanks you greatly for doing this and be warned. You'll be hearing from me again when it comes to these episodes. Fantastic. I'm glad you're listening, and I hope you're enjoying it. You two are fantastic people. It is a blessing to consider you both friends, and thank you for sharing your incredible personalities and passions with us. And then Asterisk puts out cigarette. Oh, look at him setting the mood. Right back at you, Nick. Best always, and keep watching the skies. Your smoky man and crazy pal, DJ Nick. Keep watching the skis. <laughs> And there is my Simpsons reference, everybody. Good night. (laughs) Check, please. (laughs) Mic drop. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So, so I would like to think everybody, everybody at home, take a drink. I would like to think that DJ Nick set me up for that one. (laughs) Probably, probably. (laughs) All right. So, thank you, Nick. It's always great to hear from you, and we'll talk a little bit more about Nick here in a minute, probably. Yeah, we will. All right. Uh, Lastly, we have uh, Jesse Jackson. So a certain Jesse Jackson. Oh yeah, yeah. My co-host. I know on that next, guy too. My co-host on Next Stop Everywhere, the Doctor Who podcast, and the Fan of Zone podcast. That guy, yeah, that Jesse that Jackson. Guy. And uh, so he writes in about the pilot as well. He says, "Hi, Charles and Zan." It's like the first ever feedback we've gotten from uh, Jesse here. Uh, we all have culture blind spots, and X Files is one of mine. I remember seeing the advertisement for the show and thought it would be was going to be similar to the tone of the TV series Project UFO, and I had mm-hmm. and I had no interest. See, I, I'm gonna I want to I want to stop you there right for a second, Charles. Okay. And, okay. Because I remember watching the X Files yeah. and thinking like. How is this not just another like syndicated WB monsters tales from the dark side? Yeah. Friday the 13th series. Like, I mean, what, how did it, how did it get this Fox network actual time slot kind of a thing? Yeah. And then as I kept watching it, I thought to myself, oh, because it's really freaking good. (laughs) (laughs) And don't get me wrong. I love Tales from the Dark Side and Monsters and, you know, Friday the 13th, the series. I love all that stuff. Yeah. But there was this culture of 
syndicated horror sci-fi shows back yeah. in, back and they were in very, the day. They were very schlocky. Even something like Buffy was on the WB, which is a syndicated thing. And so it was um, it was surprising to me that this was not just another one of those. It was surprising to me as well. So, yeah. Um, well, I think a lot of people, because I didn't jump, we, Lori and I didn't jump on the bandwagon until like ha- about halfway through season one. Okay. I... And, then we, and then we got caught up watching reruns. I was there pretty early. I had a um, my friend Ben. My friend Ben Paulus, yeah. who now lives in Oregon, actually, come to think of it, interesting, was like, you you guys need to be watching this show. He doesn't have bumps on his back, does he? Uh, no, he does not, actually. Okay. Um, but uh, he was like, you guys need to be watching the show. And so, and we were, we were kids. Yeah. So what were we doing on a Friday night? Nothing. Not a whole heck of a lot. You know, it's not like we were. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point because. There's like nothing on normally on Friday nights until the X Files. Uh, yeah, and Friday then, night. And then it took like... off and then got moved to Sundays at nine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Sunday was like the greatest night of the week because it was, it was uh, Simpsons. Yeah. King of the Hill, X Files. It was like just count me out from eight to ten. Yeah. On Sundays, don't ask me any questions. Don't call me. Don't ask me to do anything. I'm busy. It's not happening. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So uh, Jesse continues. He says, a few years later, I realized that I had missed the boat, and then it was too late. It's never too late, Jesse. It's called DVDs. Right. Uh, even now, when the series was available to binge, other shows took my time. However, once Charles shared with me that you two were going to discuss a few episodes, I knew this was my opportunity to take a dip into the X-Files pool. Mm. So... Well, if I can get somebody hooked on X Files, I say that's worth it, right? I think that's worth it, and I I hope I hope. Uh, oh, you're hoping. I hope Jesse likes the X Files more than he likes the Daleks. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We're gonna have to. That's have my to little sit... joke with Jesse that I give him a hard time for not liking the Daleks. Well, you know, I give him a hard time because he didn't like K nine. So what? Yeah, you didn't know about that. No. I was, I, yeah. I, I was, I think, I, what? Yeah, he thought that K9 was just uh, um, silly, stupid, and then Lori, who well, loves K9. of course K-9. he is, but he's amazing. Yeah, exactly. So, so, <laughs> so Lori got on him through me, you know, like, you know, you tell him, like Lori told me to like, tell Jesse that he, you I tell said, Jesse that, he that better, I said that he is yeah, wrong. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um. So now it's become a thing where he he is panicked, and every time we bring up K nine, he's like, "No, no, I love K nine. No, no, he's so, fine. I don't. Please don't hit yes, me, Lori. <laughs> please, yes. Even the robotic animals, Lori, is all like, "Do not mess with me." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's the thing. Okay, here, all right, people. This this is the kind of thing where you can agree to disagree. Yeah. All right. This is when it's okay to say that phrase. Right. <laughs> Jesse doesn't have to like K9. I just think he's losing out on some joy in his life. That's all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We've we've had this discussion, so um we're trying really hard to bring him around. On in all seriousness, I do hope I do hope Jesse does enjoy the X-Files. I hope it hasn't been overblown for him because yeah. honestly, if you've been hearing for the last 27 years how awesome yeah. X-Files is and then you go back and watch this pilot you're going to be like eh you know well here's what he says so he says the pilot was very enjoyable good yes did, all right yes Fantastic. that's a good start good start yeah. i did have a little problem working out scully's timeline she looked a little too old for someone to have only been in the FBI for 2 years but when you figure 4 years of college then at she least she was in medical four, school Four years of medical school plus residency, she would be 29 when the series starts. Yeah. So uh, Mulder is a few years older, but since he joined the FBI right out of graduation from Oxford, it makes sense. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, once I got the timeline in my head figured out, I could relax and enjoy the story. See, I'm glad he said that because I'm the same way about things like that. Like things will just drive me crazy. Have I told you my Amelie story? See, I, would, I wouldn't have fixated on that at all. I, would I just fixate like, on stuff like that all the time. Have I told you my Amelie story? I, you may have, but I'm not sure. Please remind okay. me. 
the movie Amelie, <laughs> and this, um, in the movie Amelie, she works at a cafe probably like four hours a week. Like she's barely there. Okay. Yeah. Yet yeah. she has this wonderful apartment in the middle of Paris. Okay. Okay. So for about like for like halfway through this movie, that's all I'm fixating on is how how she forward this apartment. Yes. And so I had to come up with a backstory in my head that she is the beneficiary of the settlement that the family got from the Catholic Church when her mother was killed by a falling gargoyle. <laughs> and once I figured that, once I had that backstory in my head, yeah. then I was able to relax and watch the movie. Because the entire time I'm watching this movie, I'm like, you work four hours a week at a cafe. You are serving cappuccinos i'm not it's not like you're it's not like you're pulling down tons of tips on like That's... huge steak dinners with 300 hundred dollar bottles of wine at the whole thing how are you affording this apartment and then i just and then i was like oh she probably has like millions of euro from the catholic church because her mother was killed by a gargoyle from one of the churches that's hilarious. So I am with you, Jesse. Sometimes that kind of thing drives me insane. Okay. Well, at least you got it worked out, right? Yeah. Uh, great character actors, Cliff DeYoung, uh, Charles Chiaffi, uh, and Leon Russell add some depth to the episode. I like the chemistry between our two leads and the way they quickly become partners. Mm -hmm. Mulder, Mulder's excitement about what can't be explained works perfectly with Scully's skepticism, which I know is one of the basic tenets of the show. If the job of the pilot is to set up the world and the characters, this does a perfect job. Yeah. And you know what, Jesse? Yeah. Jesse brings up I, – I'm sorry to keep interrupting Jesse. That's all right. But, you know, we'll, get, we'll get through I this email eventually, I promise. I keep interrupting Jesse from afar. But he's, he's really hit something when he said that their chemistry is partners. Yes. Because Mulder and Scully aren't friends. They're partners. No. Yeah, exactly. They're, it's more – it's a working relationship. They are extremely close partners because they are in life-threatening situations, but they're not going to the movies together on their days off. You know, no. when he gets, you know, when he has an extra ticket to go see Metallica, he's not taking her. Well, you, you know, know, he does come by, you know, in the pilot, he goes like, hey, you want to go for a run with me? He, he says, you want to go for a run? But that's sort of like, but hey. she turn, But she also says no. She turns him down and. Like, I'm busy working. And, like, yeah. you're supposed to be. I've got, well, no, it was four in the morning. I know. So, but yeah, he says, you want to go for a run? But that's like, that's like something people do on their lunch hours together. You know, yeah. like I've, I've known people at work who have like lunch hour walking clubs. Yeah. So, yeah, they're partners. They're not friends. They're partners. And that's a very good observation and description of how they are together. So please continue. Okay. So he says, I also like that from the beginning, the mysterious smoking man is featured. Mm -hmm. Even with my only casual awareness of the series, I know he ends up playing an important role. Yep. Yep, this is true. Very important. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to take time to binge watch the full series right now, but I do know that I plan – to watch the episodes you both will be discussing, and I'll keep X-Files on my sh list of shows that I will need to binge sometime. I give this episode 8 out of 10 mosquito bites. Nice. You keep hope alive, your partner in time, Jesse Jackson. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you, Jesse. And uh, great to hear from you. And uh, hopefully you keep sending us feedback. And I think you'll enjoy the episodes we're going to be doing. I think you'll like yeah. them. Yeah. Now, some of this stuff is probably me... Because you know you're not you're going out of order, you may be a little lost here and there, but I think overall you'll be okay. But a lot of uh, um, a lot of these early episodes are pretty self-contained. They are pretty self-contained, and Chris and I were talking about this last night when I was watching this because I, I do I will admit that I do often watch what we're supposed to be doing the night before, so it's yes. extremely fresh in my mind. Right. I might read up on it, or you know get get some IMDb or Wikipedia or other research done, but I watch it the night before. So it's very fresh and, you know, quotes are fresh and I don't forget anything. Cause um, we live in a dumpster fire right now <laughs> and my brain is real foggy these days. So anyway, so you're, you're basically, you're, you're, you have COVID brain like everybody I have else. COVID brain big time. So yeah. we were watching it and we were, we were talking about how both Chris and I, prefer the standalone episodes to the anthology episodes of X-Files. Yeah. Because in the anthology episodes, so many bad things happen to the characters we like. 
You mean the mythology, not anthology. Yes, the mythology. Sorry. COVID okay. brain. COVID brain. Yeah. So, so the standalones of which Homebug is one. Yeah. Um, I, I love because they're darkly funny. Yeah. A lot of the time. And they're a nice digression from what is sometimes hard to watch. Okay. You know, hard to watch our, hard to watch our It gives you a break. It gives you a break from the mythology. It gives me a break from the freaking oil in the eyeballs and. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, like people getting injectors in the back of the neck and all And that. I don't have to look at Krychek's stupid face. Krychek. <laughs> Krychek. Crichek. Poor, Poor Nicholas Ray. It's like if I ever met him in real life and he'd be like, hi, I'm Nicholas Ray, I'd be like, oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> it's, just, it's Pavlovian for me at this point. He's a, probably a perfectly wonderful person. He's a very talented I'm sure he actor. is. I'm but, sure he is. Oh, congrats to you, Nicholas Ray, for being that hateful. I love it. I love you for it. He was so good at being bad. He was so good at being like one of the most hated characters on yeah. television for me. Um so and I and I feel the same way about the series Supernatural that I prefer the standalone episodes to the oh Sam's going to hell and Cat or something's going down. So I hope that uh, and and the ones we pick the, you know the one with Scully's father is a little bit mythology because it is about Scully's bigger role in in the abduction slash. Yeah, genetic splicing slash immortality thing going on that she's got. But there's a, it's also about other things, and we'll we'll talk about that because I mean it's also about it's also about her faith a little bit, a little bit, yep, and um and other things. So yeah, it's uh, a really good it's a really good insight into Scully. So, yeah. um, so if you want to be like Nick and you want to be like Jesse, please do write to us, uh, Ghostwood Podcast at Gmail dot com. That's Ghostwood Podcast at the gmail dot com, and then of course Ghostwood Cast on Twitter or on Facebook at Ghostwood Twin Peaks Podcast. We'd love to hear from you. And uh, other than that, um, next time on Ghostwood, we're going to be talking here at episode eighty-two, uh, the episode we we're just now talking about, Beyond the Sea. But break out the Bobby Darren. My heart will lead me there, somewhere beyond the sea, somewhere yes. waiting for me. My lover stands on golden sands. All right, we're done. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I'm gonna do the whole song if you don't if you don't stop me. Pretty much. So, uh, but uh, obviously, we're going to be paying especially close attention to a certain actor by the name of Don S. Davis, the late great Don Davis. As Dana Scully's father, who's introduced into this as uh, he dies, mm-hmm. so, oddly enough. Mm-hmm. But uh, he keeps his head, though. He yeah, dies, he does. He dies a, in one his, piece. So. Unlike Twin Peaks, his head is not floating around in the in the um, uh, the oh, what's the name of for that um, the void or what? No, what, what was it? The you know they had a um, a name for that in the. Um, yeah. Bill Hastings newsletter. Do you remember? Damn it! I can't remember. Oh. I know. I'm. I'm. I'm, I'm yeah. What, I'm, it, I'm having a COVID brain moment. I'm having here. a COVID brain moment. What is it called? It's yeah. the the zone. The zone. Thank you. The zone. Thank you. Yes. Uh, anyway, I don't know how I could have forgotten that, but I did. I'm floating around so, in the zone. Yeah. I'm glad you. I'm glad you remembered. So. Uh, so yeah. Um, Dennis Davis does a really great job in this, and this is a great Scully episode. It is. So uh, it's going to be a lot of fun to talk to. I think we meet some other members, obviously, like our mother and her sister in this, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. So uh, yeah. it should be very educational for those like Jesse who haven't seen X-Files. But uh, for those of us of a little bit older persuasion that, um, yeah, you know, that uh, who are familiar with it, it's a nice little flashback. Are we older than Jesse? No, we're not older than Jesse, but we are more experienced in X Files than Jesse. Oh, I understand what you're saying. I was yeah, I, was... I kind of I kind of phrased that poorly there, so yeah. I apologize for that. I kind of bungled, I kind of totally mangled that. But 
of the uh, with the, the old guard of X Files nerddom, I guess, is what we are. Yeah, yeah. I was just I was just trying to say that we are experienced. Oh, <gasps> look at what you did there. See what I did there? I see what you did there. Have you ever been experienced? Well, I have. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, everybody not in like a uh, Jimi Hendrix way, but in certain yeah. things. Exactly, exactly. Certainly in Twin Peaks and X-Files way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly in uh, being afraid of people and staying home and watching nerd TV way. Yeah, hell yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, if you're going to be hiding out from people, what better way than to uh, watch X-Files with us, Watch some scary shit, yeah. I mean, uh, enjoy it, right? Yeah. So, uh, everybody, thank you so much for listening to our X-Files, first X-Files episode. Hope it lived up to uh, certain DJ Nick's expectations. I hope so, too. I hope so, too, because otherwise we'll never hear the end of it. And um, everybody, thanks again. And come on back next time, two weeks, presumably. Mm-hmm. We're back on our regular, regularly scheduled programming. Yep. Episode 82 as we talk Beyond the Sea Ba-da-ba-ba. with Dennis Davis and uh, lots of great X-Files uh, mythos. So thanks again, and we'll see you next time right here on Ghostwood, the Twin Peaks podcast. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs> We made this.